I would like to welcome you all to the Cycle 4 information session. For those of you that don't know who I am, my name is Elaine Wadler, and I'm the Director of Programs here at the Digital Technology Supercluster. I also have Bill Tam, who everyone knows. Uh, of course, he's our co-founder and Chief Operating Officer. As the majority of our Supercluster team is based in Vancouver, British Columbia, I would like to acknowledge that we are gathering virtually on the traditional lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. Just a few housekeeping things before we get going. We recommend that you set your Zoom to speaker view for optimal viewing. Our goal is to have the session to be engaging and informative. So if at any point you have a question during the presentation, we ask that you please type it into the chat box and we will take those questions at the end of the presentation. As a reminder, this call will be recorded and we ask all participants to keep their lines muted during the presentation to avoid any feedback. We will also be distributing both the recording as well as the presentation deck after the session so you can share it with your team and refer to it back um, as need be. All right, we'll go on to the agenda. Okay, second. So you can continue on. Yeah. So at first, Bill's going to start off uh, the morning. Um, giving you an overview of the supercluster and in order to give you context um, for where Cycle 4 is coming from. And then I will uh, walk you through the highlights, the process, what will help you be successful in your proposals, and finally, where you can get the support and resources that you will need as you, as you put those uh, proposals together. So with that, I will hand it over to Bill. Thanks, Elaine. Good morning, everyone. Uh, and uh, it's great to welcome so many new members and associates uh, in looking at the registration list uh, today. I, I know a number of you are coming at this for the first time, so I thought maybe we could set some context before we get into the details of Cycle 4, just to make sure you have all the tools that you need to be successful in this endeavor. And we're really excited to have all of you with us. Uh, so maybe where I, I, I thought I'd start, because I was just uh, last week speaking with John Sackhouse, who's the Senior Vice President at RBC, and he just published a new book called Planet Canada. He has this fantastic line that I think just kind of underscores what we're trying to do as a supercluster. You know, he says, you know, collaboration is uh, the most overused and underappreciated skill in business. Too many people confuse it with cooperation. It is not. Uh, collaboration is about charting new courses with others using collective intelligence to build something better. And that's what we're here for. It's uh, essentially that statement that underscores the essence of what we're trying to do as a supercluster. Next slide, please. So for those of you who have been through a few rounds with us on supercluster uh, projects, uh, you know, essentially this is the summation of the program framework that we designed pretty well from the onset. The model is about collaborative R&D projects, uh, but the key is to do these collaborations such that the ultimate uh, products or solution can address uh, cross industry challenges and at the same time develop products that can really scale not only across industries, but hopefully uh, across the world. And where we started was, what are the challenges and opportunities? And we really focused initially on three industry areas. One was in healthcare, the second one was industrial, which included industrial manufacturing, transportation, logistics, and infrastructure. And the third was in natural resources. That was mining, uh, oil and gas, forestry, agriculture. And we could apply technology opportunities in the areas of data collection, data analysis, and data visualization, using the full spectrum of capabilities that we know we have in Canada. And across these uh, sectors and across these opportunities, we could map cross-sectoral programs, which leads you to the right-hand side. These are really the areas of our investment focus. Uh, the blue areas indicate the areas where we're focused on investing in in technology R&D projects. And the orange area and capacity building is really the framework for building out our capabilities across the ecosystem. Uh, if we move to the next slide, please, I can break this down. So our areas of focus uh, in the technology areas consist of a data commons program, a digital twins program, a precision health program, and then uh, lo and behold, in March, when we entered into the pandemic uh, arising from COVID-19, we spun up a specific program to address and provide uh, support in the remediation of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, and finally on capacity building. Uh, Data Commons, I think uh, many of the folks that are here 
uh, are familiar with the concept, but ultimately it's about uh, being able to aggregate data sets and provide capabilities and useful tools for data analytics across different domains. Uh, Digital Twins is really uh, our program area around building real-time simulation of uh, real-world events and environments. And so that uses augmented virtual reality, but other simulation tools uh, to really uh, approximate cyber physical type of uh, environment. Precision Health is everything that we can do to uh, advance the cause of wellness and personalized healthcare. And uh, that ties not just data elements to it, but also research uh, collaboration and other projects that can uh, bring a number of different asset uh, pieces together. Uh, COVID-19, I already explained, was really in response to the pandemic. And that's a program that we started in March and uh, pretty well concluded in the summer. But many of those projects that we did in that, uh, in that program will continue to have uh, opportunities to extend their capabilities into the fields of precision health and some of the other program areas that I just mentioned. And I talked a little bit about capacity building. It really is about building the ecosystem both locally and across the country. Next slide, please. Uh, so I thought I might just emphasize, uh, you know, where it is that our investments are really coming from and how we kind of make some of these determinations. Uh, clearly, as one of five superclusters in the country, there are some, there are some foundational rules and program uh, elements that are consistent across all superclusters. And that is we're really talking about uh, industry-led R&D projects. Uh, we select them through a competitive selection process, which really means that we can we can work with you to ensure that it's the best possible um, solution set and has all the attributes that ultimately you may be looking for and, all, and, and others in the consortium. Uh, it is really important to uh, keep in mind that these are industry-led initiatives. And so it's innovation, but more specifically, it's going to result in R&D product and outcome. These are collaborations. And so we look at the consortiums. It's like building a team sport around R&D. It's really important. I'll get into more detail about what success looks like there. And what we do is we provide matching co-investment. And the matching co-investment is, in, is intended to provide a, a lever to de-risk the proposition to create sort of the, um, the larger base of capital from which you can have larger scale projects and hopefully more ambition. Uh, and ultimately, many of our projects are multi-year commitments. And it just depends on uh, what the nature of the undertaking is and so we have multi-year commitments with many of our projects. Next slide, please. Uh, and we've been quite fortunate. Our community collaborators started off, as you would expect, uh, with a real centricity around British Columbia, which is where we're located. But over time, we've seen uh, the expanse of the digital supercluster reach uh, all across the country. And from coast to coast, uh, we see members and associates that have really uh, been part of this uh, accelerating ride, and we're really pleased to see that. Next slide, please. Uh, so as I get into our track record of investments, and again, I'll just remind everybody that if you have questions at any point, just type them into the chat window, and we'll be sure to answer them in the Q&A portion at the end. Uh, but we have been at this now for a couple of years, and we've seen an accelerating rate of investments that we've been doing across the portfolio uh, and program streams that I mentioned earlier. You know, our portfolio now uh, is comprised of more than $200 million worth of projects. It's across more than 60 projects. Uh, industry co-investment, which is really the catalyst for this, is really a big portion of what we've seen. And uh, there are now almost nearly 300 organizations that are collaborating across these projects. So it's really a testament, I think, to the to the, uh, the model and how uh, our community is uh, really taking to it. Next slide, please. So uh, one of the things that we're noticing is as we've gone through a couple of years of investments that there are some themes that are emerging. And although we designed it around the programs that I mentioned earlier, we are, we are seeing themes out of those programs that are worth paying attention to. You know, one, not surprisingly, especially with a COVID program, there's an awful lot going on in the area of digital health. And you can see some of those elements in that circle on the top left, you know, everything from virtual health to AI enabled diagnostics, mental health and wellness, these concepts around what the future of healthcare delivery might be, including digital hospitals. And then in the context of COVID-19, 
things like how we deal with pandemics and infectious disease management, access control, and a whole host of other things that are broadly in the digital health spectrum. Uh, at the same time, we're also seeing a number of projects that thematically are tied not only to natural resources, but also the marriage of natural resources and the impact on the environment. And so we're seeing uh, quite a number of projects in areas of environmental monitoring and modeling. Uh, we're looking at uh, things that deal with natural uh, resource management, uh, emergency response, uh, food security, some of the supply chain elements related to each natural resources industry. So there's quite a bit that it ties those things together. On the bottom left, you'll see in the digital transformation side, we're seeing digital transformation projects across multiple uh, industry sectors. Everything from you know, smart fleets, robotics, uh, learning factories or learning environments for uh, simulated uh, sort of uh, infrastructure, um, automated inspection and what, what can be done to kind of digitize that process. So there's quite a bit going on in digital transformation. And finally, we're seeing projects not only inside R&D projects, but also as part of our capacity building program around uh, equipping the digital workforce. And that's everything from uh, providing training and skills development on autonomous systems, applied AI, and a lot of it is really um, around uh, familiarity on digital ventures. Some of it is, is spinning up new capabilities on that, but it really is around the literacy elements of what digital can mean for, uh, for the workforce and the future economy. Next slide, please. And, uh, and the reason why I highlighted those themes, I wanna interconnect the themes I just mentioned with uh, what we've seen to date on successful projects. And between the intersection of those two slides, hopefully that sets the context for what Elaine's gonna uh, present to you, which is what we're doing in the next cycle and call for projects. But now that we've done over 60 projects, what we're seeing as sort of the path to success for them is like, first of all, the team, you know, the as you would in any of your organizations, it always comes down to not just the strategy that you're uh, pursuing, but the team that you put around it to execute on it. So assembling the right consortium across organizations to execute on what you're seeking to do. The second area is clarity of the product. So the R&D outcome is really important. So this, this is really about knowing what it is that you're trying to build, uh, and, and that comes through that collaborative exercise of everyone participating in a conversation that discovers something better that you wouldn't have been able to discover if you were just doing this on your own. And that clarity of outcome is really important in guiding the team and who does what in order to achieve that. Uh, the third area is successful projects have had uh, the conversations about what the commercial arrangement needs to be amongst the consortium partners. In other words, you know, as you pick the, uh, the people on your team, you're, you're predetermining who's contributing what, and when you actually finish the product and you finish the project, how you're gonna share in the benefit. And that's really important because it's important to have those sort of levels of understanding upfront, as opposed to at the time that you're doing contracting and then trying to figure it out then, because by then, you know, perhaps you're on completely different wavelengths and that makes that, super problematic. Uh, the fourth area is just to understand IP and your data strategy. And what that means is that the players that are part of a consortium are bringing uh, various assets and expertise, some of which may be in the form of intellectual property, how it is that you're gonna protect what you have done and yet bring that to the table so that you can, the entire team can benefit from that. You're gonna create new things. And then what are you gonna do when the new thing is, is built? How will you share in that benefit? And that's both in, in terms of the intellectual property that may arise from a project, as well as data and digital assets that you may actually create. Uh, the next area is around having a market plan. And, and so successful projects have, a, have an understanding of what they're gonna do with the product or the R&D outcome once they finish it. How will they take it to market? Who's gonna take it to market? How might it actually be priced? Who are the likely customers? all the things you would expect to see uh, just a glimpse of when you're actually putting together a proposal uh, for how you wanna make an investment. And finally, for us, because we have a mandate to uh, build not only benefits to the consortium, but across the ecosystem in Canada at large, 
it's a it's a crisp and clear articulation of how this benefits the ecosystem in Canada. So hopefully those will provide some guide points for uh, how to build successful projects. Next slide, please. And and so I'm just going to spend a minute on the team because this is really the core of what makes for great projects and, and fantastic collaboration. Uh, you can see here that, uh, and many of you probably have gone through some orientation pieces with us, this is what we call a model consortium. It's got players uh, with different skill sets that come together to build something that couldn't have been uh, built on their own. So on the left-hand side, one of the key elements in this design is to have an industry partner or partners. These are essentially customers. This is the demand side of the equation that says, this is what they need to solve an industrial challenge that they have. And so there's uh, specificity and clarity around what the market adoption characteristics would look like. At the same time, you've also got a technology lead partner or partners. Those are the product companies that are actually going to build out the capability, but they're going to do it in collaboration with co-development partners, co-development partners that have particular areas of expertise. Some of them may be startups, but they uh, together between the product uh, lead company co-development partners, they have the assembly of a full solution. The technical service providers on the bottom left provide the uh, avenue to ensure that the solution can be uh, successfully integrated into the customer environment and that it actually uh, has all the features necessary to get things up and running. Post-secondary research partners essentially provide sort of the forward-looking uh, capability. It's a differentiator that we think is super important because uh, we will be able to commercialize sort of the, the, the research that's been happening in the university setting, but bringing it into context in, the, uh, in, in terms of these projects, which will give ultimately a competitive advantage for the product that's being developed. And where we uh, fit in is as a co-investor and hopefully as a facilitator for this collaboration to come together. And you can see on the right-hand side, a few tips, you know, having a product lead partner, having committed customer adopters, having complementary expertise and clear expectations and contributions. And ultimately, uh, the expectation is this kind of model is more than the sum of its parts. It really is something that can be multiplicative in terms of outcomes. Next slide, please. Uh, so on this one, hopefully I've given enough context and uh, now I'm going to turn it over to Elaine who's going to share more details about the next call for project. Thanks, Bill. Thanks for the great overview and, and the context. Bold, ambitious, impactful. That's how we want to describe Cycle 4 projects. And that's not just lip service. We want the projects in Cycle 4 to make a difference. So we want this funding to go towards solving complex and important projects. So think big. This is our largest technology leadership call to date. Our goal is to co-invest up to 30 million and ideally would like to fund five to seven projects. So doing the math, we're looking to invest roughly four million or more per project. Now this isn't prescriptive, but it does give you a sense of what we're aiming for. And to give you more context, we had some of the biggest projects in cycle three. The average supercluster co-investment rate in that cycle was 2.1. So we're essentially looking to double our investment amount per project. So it is different. Now that doesn't mean, I know you're going to ask, it doesn't mean we aren't going to look at smaller projects, but if you are proposing something smaller, we encourage you to think beyond that initial concept. Where can you take it? Is there another partner out there that if, if they were to join the consortium, it could take it to the next level? So we can, we can help make those introductions and connections. We aren't stating a minimum, but we really want to fund big, bold, ambitious, and impactful projects. The good news is that we are accepting submissions on a continuous intake or rolling basis, so there are no deadlines. We want quality submissions, and bigger projects tend to be more complex, so we don't want you to have to rush through certain sections in order to meet a deadline. You can take the time to hammer out the details up front. That being said, it is a finite funding envelope, and, and so obviously the strongest applications that come around first will have the highest chances of success that we will be reviewing on a regular cadence. Next slide. So looking at the three main areas of interest for this cycle, the first one has to do with keeping Canadians safe and healthy. 
We're looking for technology solutions that can support a resilient healthcare system and empower Canadians to manage their own health and wellness. There are a lot of examples in the program guide, um, which I'm assuming everybody has read already, so I'm not going to go through them in, into detail here. Uh, the second focus, but you can find them there if you haven't looked at it yet. The second focus uh, area is climate change and protecting the environment. We're looking for technology solutions that help us protect the planet, enable us to best manage our natural resources, ensure, ensure food security, and reduce emissions. And then finally, accept Accelerating digital transformation. So looking at tech solutions that can support the digitization to help companies grow and increase profitability. And you could think about, you could be digitizing traditional sectors like mining and forestry, providing digital solutions that can help them modernize and compete globally, or developing technologies that'll help companies transition to this new online economy that we've been hurled into. Next slide. So now into the details around eligibility. As per the case with all our tech leadership projects, there has to be a minimum of three organizations participating and they all must be contributing in a meaningful way. It has to include at least one post-secondary institution and at least one small or mid-sized um, enterprise. For those that have been part, I think most of the audience, uh, a lot of you at, were only involved in our, our COVID stream. So you probably want to note that the requirements for collaboration were a little bit on the lighter side for that stream and, and different than what we expect in tech leadership and in this cycle. You will score more points if you assemble a diverse and inclusive team that includes underrepresented groups. So you want to make note of those and, and, um, and highlight them in your presentation or in your proposals. Projects should be incremental to the regular business undertakings of the participating organizations. We're, we're not here to fund your day-to-day -day businesses. And something that's a little bit different from previous cycles and that we're moving up the, member, the timing of when you have to be at a certain membership level. So now um, when you're uh, involved or submitting your expression of interest, all project consortium members should be associate members, which is the free membership that we call more an exploratory one. But by the time the full proposal is being submitted, everybody should have converted to a full member. Okay, go to the next slide, please. So Bill's already gone this through the slide. Um, so while we have that minimal eligibility requirement, the three organizations, this really is what we found over the last number of years, what makes that ideal consortium. So it's really important, you know, besides having that lead partner with the product, um, to have the, the integration, the solution integrator there as well. And then also, of course, having the customer and our adopter there to make sure you have the, a good market fit uh, from the outset. So it's really great to have all these people at the table at the beginning. Next slide. So now just to take a step back, and for, you, for those of you that are actually new completely to the super cluster, um, here's how our investment works. Our funding is based on a cost incurred model. So you must incur the cost first, then you submit a claim, and then we reimburse you on those costs that are eligible. We do have a set of co-investment guidelines that you can read through that list what is and what isn't eligible. There are probably a few things to note that, that maybe um, need particular attention. Foreign costs, we're really funding work that's done in Canada. So if there is work being done outside of the country, those expenses typically won't be co-invested in unless they are absolutely necessary for the success of the project and cannot otherwise be performed in Canada. If that's the case, you will have to submit an application and that will have to be pre-approved prior to any spending. Also, one thing that's slightly different is existing IP. If it's already commercialized, for example, software licenses, they are an eligible cost. However, if they are still in development, um, they are now ineligible. Okay, um, this cycle is no different than the other tech leadership calls in that we, we co-invest up to 43% of the eligible costs. Um, just a reminder that under the new membership structure at the end of March, project-based fees will be in effect and will be taken off at claims time. With respect to IP, we invest in R&D solutions that support the commercial, commercialization of products to spur economic development. To that end, we're looking for that sound IP and data strategy that's necessary so that commercialization can take place. So who owns what, who gets 
what licenses, on what terms. Those are necessary issues that need to be worked out within a consortium. Next slide. And to the next slide. So what's the process for cycle four? Next slide, please. So it really is a two-step process, despite there being three boxes on this slide. Um, this time we're asking you to reg register. Oh, you can go back to the, the slide before. There we go. Uh, when you register your interest, we're going to ask you at a high level what problem you're solving. Oh, you can flip back again to the three boxes. That's good. We'll be there for a minute. When you register, so we're asking you what problem you're solving at a high level. What's your solution? If you have a team put together, and if so, who are they? And how big is the project? There are a couple of reasons for this stage, and the first is to ensure that you're on the right track, so as not to waste anybody's time, but it also helps us see what's cooking in the pipeline and if there's any matchmaking to be done. Um, if all is on the right track, then you'll be, submitted, sub, you'll be invited to submit an expression of interest, or EOI. It's the project lead that submits the EOI on behalf of the consortium. At this stage, you may be asked to present or at least provide more information. And we'll be evaluating the fit, the eligibility, and the potential for success. Um, a successful EOI will then give you an invitation to submit a full project proposal or FPP. This time it's submitted by the entire consortium, project consortium. And again, you may be asked to present. Although if you've written a strong and clear proposal, you may just need to answer questions and answers from the Evaluation Committee. The Evaluation Committee is a group of independent and external experts. They make a recommendation, but the final decision is made by the digital super cluster. Uh, a big change from previous calls is at the FPP stage, there's a much greater focus on IP um, and budget and commercialization, but particularly at I, in IP, you know, it's probably one of the higher risk areas um, when contracting for contracting not to be successful. So we really want you to have these hard conversations ahead of time and figure out you know, who owns what and have that all fleshed out, as we mentioned before, prior to, to contracting. All right, next slide. The evaluation criteria, this is the same that, uh, criteria that we've used for every cycle and the COVID program as well. There's nothing new here. Um, there's a lot of details in the program guide, so I won't go through them, but obviously we're looking for a very uh, strong team, strong consortiums with world-class capabilities and added value through cooperation. Um, we're looking for proposals with high degree of innovation and achievability. Commercial impact, very important, delivering commercial outcomes. So we really wanna see what that business model looks like and what the return of investment is. Um, and then ecosystem impact. Are we advancing research, scaling up SMEs? What new jobs are resulting? Next slide. And just as a, a note, the sample templates for both the expression of interest and the full project proposal are available on the website. So you can see what the applications look like ahead of time. Now I've mentioned a few things throughout the presentation, but I thought it was worth making a point to outline differences from past programs. So you're clear if you've only had experience, let's say with COVID, or other tech leadership programs. Um, for those that have only been involved in the COVID stream, this cycle has bigger consortiums. There are more organizations and certain types of organizations are required. So the eligibility is different and projects are larger. If successful, the master project agreement isn't just between the lead and the super cluster, but it's a multi-party agreement that's signed by everyone. And of course, there is the fixed co-investment rate. With COVID, we had flexibility around industry matching levels, but here we have a set co-investment rate of 43%. So again, it's very much industry-led for tech leadership in the cycle. And foreground IP is listed on the IP registry, which it wasn't for COVID. Um, to move to the, the, the next part of the slide, um, differences from cycle three tech leadership, we are looking for larger projects. The membership timing, as I mentioned before, shifts so that you are full members at the time the full project proposal is submitted. Um, we are providing much more 
support working with teams in the development of their proposal. And this is something we incorporated with the COVID project and was really well received. So we will work with you along the way to ensure that all aspects of the proposal are, are strong before submitting. And to that end, there is a very much an increased focus on what that commercial plan is, how the IP plan is going to pan out and, um, and budget within the proposal. Okay, so definitely getting clarity on these things up front will increase your chances of success. Next slide. And you can go to the next slide. So what are the factors for success? Collaboration, putting a strong team together, making sure you have the right players at the table and everybody's got the proper roles. Clarity, who's doing what, who owns what, and how the funding flows, and then impact. So we have a lot of details in the program guide around our evaluation criteria. But I would say this is really the list that distills down the most important factors. So I would keep this in front of you when you're developing your project concepts and really throughout the rest of the program or the, throughout the rest of the process. You can go to the next slide. Other tips um, include, you know, have a single proposal writer, someone that's holding the pen, because yes, it does make a difference to have a clear and well-written proposal and start the hard conversations early despite the lack of a deadline. Um, it's, it's really important that you, you solve a lot of those problems ahead of time. Don't just focus on the technology. You want to keep the commercial return in mind from the outset. And then finally, reach out because we are here certainly to support and guide you. We want you to be successful as, as much as you do. Next slide. Speaking of uh, resources, you can go to the next slide. So the program guide can be found on our website and in it are a multitude of links to all the necessary documentation that you'll need. This is also where updates and announcements will be made regarding the status of the cycle. Once you are an associate member, you have access to the resource portal, which has everything you need from co-investment guidelines, the sample templates for the expression of interest and full project proposal, the IP and data policies that we adhere to, as well as the list of members and associates. There is going to be um, a master project agreement and budget template uh, that should be up in the coming weeks. Everything else that is, is already currently on the website. All right, next slide, please. We will also be offering a number of workshops and web webinars over the next couple months to help you with all kinds of things, whether it's you know, creating and working within our budget template, um, helping to figure out the IP plan, uh, how to create successful collaboration, as well as ideation and networking workshops. And we have investment leads who will be working with you to help develop your project concept and help make those referrals and intros if you need to expand your consortium. So please don't hesitate to reach out for clarity and guidance as you formulate your plan. Next slide. So really the next step review the program guide in detail, start to connect with other members and talk about some ideas, do some brainstorming, and then formulate your project concept and register your interest. So with that, uh, we look forward to seeing your ideas and I will open it up to questions and answers. Next slide. So Elaine, we have quite a number of questions that are on the chat. Um, right. uh, I, I wonder, Annika, if you wouldn't mind moderating that and you could just start us from the top and make sure that we keep track of all the questions that have come up. Okay, and we do have some other people, I believe, that are online who may join in to answer some questions as well. Um, so the first, question is what is the acceptable range for budget and multi-year timelines range for budget um, so if you're thinking about it you know greater than 10 million dollar uh, project size over the you know executed over the next two to three years is really the goal does that answer your question, Marty? Oh, I think you might be on mute, sorry. 
Uh, I'm a little confused because I thought you were talking about um, 4 million plus uh, for, for each project and you just mentioned greater than 10 million. So yes, I was talking the 4 million refers to the digital supercluster portion. And if we're investing 43%, that means the total project cost ah, would be got it, about got it. greater than 10 million. Right. Yeah. So, uh, and by the way, in the RI form online, it asks for uh, us to submit a budget number. Is that the total project or is that the piece that the, uh, that, that would include the supercluster contribution? That would be the total project cost. Right. So, so you don't have to worry about that yet. Yes. Well, for the RI, don't we need to get the RI in quickly? Yes, you can, sorry, you cut out a little bit, but for the sure. RI, you can look at total project cost. And then of course, I mean, you're gonna to wanna to be thinking about the super cluster contribution for your own budgeting purposes. Yes, but. yeah, yeah, okay. Um, from Jennifer, we have a question asking if you could clarify the reimbursement for IP. Looking for the, the question, Bill, do you see it? reimbursement for IP? Not sure I understand the yes, question. Yes, I believe uh, Jennifer is asking the question because Elaine, uh, in your presentation, you talked about IP that was brought into the consortium and how uh, uh, there were some cost elements about what would be reimbursed in that. And I think maybe that's uh, that pertains to the question on that. That's correct. Oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah. sorry about that. There is something that we call DCCs, uh, and uh, basically it's looking at costs that, that may be, and software costs is, uh, or software licenses is a good example of that. So if you have a software license that's in development that you'll be using as part of the project, um, but there's no way to sort of realize what the fair market value of that or how to cost it out, it will be ineligible. So those software licenses must be commercialized and then we can see what the exact cost is and then that's an eligible cost. Does that help? Yes, thank you. All right, from Francis, um, they're wondering, has there been an update to the membership tiers and membership fees? Okay, uh, thanks for that question, Francis. Good to have you on the call, by the way. Uh, there is some information we sent out back in, I think, April. You'll also find it on our website. There is, uh, under the members uh, section, uh, sorry, in the join section, there's information that's pertaining to the member uh, rates and fees. So in April of this year, we shifted all the member fees so that there's no longer a program management fee, but rather there's a membership fee for many me uh, regular members. It's $5,000 a year. And then there is a project-based fee, which is a percentage of the project, uh, the eligible cost as we submit claims. So that was the change that we made earlier this year to make it easier for SMEs and startups and many others to participate in the super cluster. Does that answer your question, Francis? Yeah, thanks, Bill. And, and that's uh, in the membership portal or uh, outside of that wall? I just posted it into the chat. Oh, great. Thank, thank you. Um, so, Bill, there's quite a few questions about matchmaking and the sort of events or workshops that will be centered around that. Okay, let me take those ones all, all, all together. We have a lot, we have now over 800 members and associates in the supercluster. So, uh, whereas in the past it was, um, it was really interesting. Uh, it's sort of the span of a few hundred that we could actually do a lot of personalized matchmaking. Now it's, it's a completely different exercise for sure. So here's what we have planned. We're gonna do some ideation workshops coming up in November. Uh, we're gonna follow the themes that Elaine had mentioned. Uh, we're just trying to get the dates sorted, but uh, what we're gonna do in this new virtual experience is have opportunities for people to kind of talk a little bit about their business and what you guys are involved in, the areas of interest, and our hope is that that will spawn some familiarity with one another that you can help to build your consortium. Separate from that, our member directory is going to be enhanced with a bit more richness. We're just working on the release of that, which should come out in the next couple of weeks. But when you uh, go to it today, you can kind of get a, a sense of 
who else is in the membership and areas of expertise or whatnot. Our hope is that we'll be able to publish a bit more information about uh, each of your organizations and especially those that are participating in projects today. So uh, you'll be able to kind of screen out the ones who maybe have had some experience in working in superclusters. As I mentioned, we have now over uh, 280 organizations that have been part of the existing project portfolio. Some of them will be good partners for you in, in that endeavor. Uh, and then the third thing I'll, I'll offer up is that, um, you know, as we go through individual project one-on-one -on -one sort of sessions, uh, we'll identify ones that you might want to uh, meet with or speak with. We'll make some introductions as we go along the way. And so you can see that there's a bit of tiering here. We're going to try to do some mass networking. We'll try to do some sort of online searches for the kind of capabilities you're looking for. And then ultimately, as you formulate your, your, um, you know, your project idea or concept, you know, we'll do our best to uh, determine which other partners you might want to be in contact with. I hope that helps answer that question. Thanks, Bill. Um, we also had a question asking if individual members should register their interest or should they create a consortium before registering? Um, Elaine, do you want to take that you one? Know, it, yeah, yeah, you don't have to have um, obviously the full consortium at the time you register interest. But you have, should have a sense of the kind of members and the, the partners that you will need um, to solve those problems. Um, but we, you know, you can continue and we'll, we'll help you along that. We can guide you with that. Um, we'll invite you to EOI when we feel that you're ready. And so we can help you work with that to get to that point. Um, yeah, so One really. One thing I might add to uh, that, Elaine. Sorry, Elaine. Go One ahead. thing I might just add to that is that there is a there is an area on the member um, resource portal which is around ideation, and so uh, if you want to make use of that to find partners, that might be a tool to do that. If you log into that, you can kind of post sort of the concept that you're thinking of and invite others to weigh in on that. You might discover there are others that want to pursue the particular research area or the R and D project area that you're interested in. Great, thank you both. Um, Sylvie's wondering. There's just one. But go ahead. Um, Sylvie's wondering who in the consortium needs to be a full member at the time of FPP. Um, at, for this cycle, we're asking everybody to be a full member by the time. Everybody that will be receiving supercluster funds as part of the project um, should be a full member at the time of FPP. Great, thanks, Elaine. Um, Mark is wondering what are the typical timelines um, the supercluster is looking for these 10 million projects? Is it over three years? So we expect execution over the next two, three years. Obviously, that's flexible. I mean, we're hoping to that projects uh, proposals will be developed and we'll be awarding those in sort of the first quarter of, of the new year and then contracting after that and execution. Thank you. Um, there was a question on what the likely timing between RI and the EOI will be. Um, I think it really depends depends how much thought has gone into it. Um, you know, we just um, so we'll we'll work with you. I mean, I think it's it's good to do some thinking before you register your interest, um, and maybe have some discussions with others first, but then. You know, again, we'll help you through that process. So it, it's really going to depend on on how much work needs to be done to pull something together. But um, you know, some people may be ready for it for it now. They've had they've been thinking about it. So um, that just it will vary. Um, Connor is wondering: Is there somewhere appropriate to publish? Here are the resources we have and the kind of projects we're open to. Maybe Bill, do you want to answer that? I want to make I want to make sure I understand the the question a bit, Connor. So, uh, the resources do you mean resources as in uh, how to how to prepare your project or resources in other in other ways? Can you underline? Make sure I understand what you mean. 
Sure, sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Great. Um, so essentially, we have um, a lot of pre-existing intellectual property targeted towards a different market. We make smartwatches for consumers. The health angle is uh, very interesting to our company. We currently can't market um, like health devices. We market wellness devices. Right. So we're sitting here with a portfolio of IP, an R&D team, um, you know, working on consumer projects. But um, but we're looking for what else can we do um, outside of the, the consumer space. So I'm just trying to figure out where do we publish saying, look, here's the tech that we already have. Here's the resources that we have from an R&D perspective. Here's the kinds of budgets that we can afford to put into a project. We don't have a project idea, though. We just have a lot of resources. Mm. Now I understand. OK, so good question, Connor. I think. Um, but certainly one thing we can do is, uh, you know, connect with me and maybe there's more I can put on your uh, specific description of your company. So when people come to yours, there's a little bit more flavoring. Yeah. I think the second area where we've got it is uh, we could probably put up, as I said, the ideation uh, hub might be a place where you can kind of put up some of those capabilities and see if that sparks interest in what others can do with that. Uh, I think ultimately what you're talking about is the richness of building truly a, uh, a robust member marketplace. Uh, we're not there yet, uh, but uh, it's a good impetus for us to uh, kind of think uh, in the future about how we can make it so that people have a bit more uh, transparency about what others are interested in, what they contribute to a project, above and beyond sort of corporate, you know, description or, or key capabilities, which is what's there now. So let's take the first two steps, Connor, and then we'll work on the third one in a future, uh, in a future release. Cool, really appreciate it. Okay, thanks. I think those are the final questions we have, if anyone, oh. Um, Sylvie's wondering, can public research organizations receive co-investment? Let me take that one. Uh, so the, um, thanks for that question, Sylvie. And I, I, I think sometimes we, um, we make a, an assumption that folks are familiar with the co-investment model, but uh, it's worth spending a bit of time on this. So the design of the supercluster program, our co-investment must go towards private sector industry players and partners. Uh, we've had post-secondary uh, research, universities, hospitals, uh, government agencies as part of uh, various projects along the way. And typically what happens is that we cannot invest in them directly. We cannot provide reimbursement to them directly but uh, the other participants in the projects may be able to flow dollars through their reimbursement to those uh, entities. And so that's how uh, post-secondary research, uh, research institutions operate. So in the context of membership and what uh, Elaine was mentioning earlier, we're seeking uh, uh, member uh, organizations to be full members when they submit the FTP. We're really talking about the industry players who are going to receive direct funds from the supercluster. Hope that answers your question. That's perfect. Thanks, Bill. So just, um, so obviously, you know, in a collaboration like that uh, between the company and the, usually the university hospital that holds the hat of both the customer and the post-secondary research partner, obviously some of the R&D work would be done at the university hospital. So it would be okay to include this in the overall budget and the money will flow from, I guess, the company and then the company can help and pay for those research expenses at the hospital site? So maybe I'll ask Elaine or Karen if you're on the line, uh, if one of you can answer Sylvie's question there. So it's Karen McClure. Um, I want to make sure that I understood your question. So first of all, as Bill said, industry could decide to sponsor some of the work being done by research entities. Sometimes re industry also sponsors my tax applications. And so um, industry would be able to get reimbursed on a portion of their costs for my tax application, which of course my tax would then match and flow the funding to the research entity. Um, certainly the, the, the hospitals or any other researchers um, would can bring other funds to the table through other grants or 
um, other government programs. Um, we can only co-invest on, as Bill said, on the industry contributions to the project. Okay, so in the, let's say, eligible budget that you look at um, mm -hmm. to calculate your 43%, we would only take into account the part that is sponsored and paid by the industry, right? To determine the super cluster portion of the co-investment, yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you a lot. Yeah, and we'll, and we'll be there to help um, project teams sort of slice and dice the budget so that it's clear what, can, what we can co-invest against and what we can't. Perfect, thanks a lot. Do we have any? Annika, do we have any other questions? Um, just, just asking if anyone does. If not, if you come across okay, any. Okay, if not. <laughs> Sorry, Annika, we seem to be uh, overlapping. We're thinking on the same wavelength. So maybe I can just uh, close with a couple of words then. And uh, uh, we're really excited to have such a, a broad spectrum of, of participants that are uh, anxious and eager to be part of this next call for projects. As you can see, as we've kind of mapped uh, a trajectory, one of the reasons why we want uh, bigger and bolder projects is because I think we're ready for it. I think the community at large can build the consortiums and the ambition that we've been seeking. And uh, we're really excited about what you guys might bring to the table. Uh, and uh, as far as uh, thanking Elaine and, and the entire program team for all the work that they put into getting this launched. And I know that they're going to run the support resources necessary to make this next call for projects a, a big success. Um, so on behalf of everyone at Supercluster team, I just want to thank everyone for participating in today's session. And uh, as Elaine had mentioned, we will remain uh, available to you guys as you go through your uh, various thought processes and there'll be more information upcoming about workshops in the, in the upcoming weeks. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you.